stream. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, it says meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. Okay, hang on, I've got to find. Well, hi everyone, Lisa Tamati here, and very excited to have you hopefully join us this morning. Uh, it's uh, 7.30 a.m. in the morning here in New Zealand, and where Dr. Alina Serenova is, it's very late at night. How are you doing, Dr. Alina? Good, good. How are you? Happy to be here again. Yeah, very excited for today's topic. So we're going to be doing a discussion around autophagy and NAD boosters uh, and sirtuin genes. So it's going to be a really interesting uh, discussion that is really beneficial for you if you want to know how to live longer, live healthier, uh, and optimize your, your, your body and your mind and your potential. So uh, Dr. Alina, can you just tell us briefly a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I, um, I started my journey as a psychologist. So I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. I, I majored in psychology at first, and then I had my own uh, private practice for five years, which turned out to be a successful wellness center. And I, I really got fascinated by neuroscience and the brain. And for this reason, at first I started studying the brain myself, and then I found uh, an amazing master's degree at the University of Sheffield in translational neuroscience, which basically um, com combined the um, the um, the research on neurodegeneration with uh, you know with applications that that could translate into therapeutics. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what translational neuroscience means. It's basically the, uh, um, the, 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 the combination and the outcome of the research of the, the hardcore biology research that can be utilized for, for therapeutic approaches in patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I really enjoyed that. So that was quite cool uh, being in the lab and, you know, doing molecular biology experiments and so on. So I kind of fell in love with the lab and I decided to do a PhD as well. And I continued my studies in autophagy and stem cell biology. And it was quite challenging, but at the same time, uh, I really enjoyed it. And I, um, I can definitely say that science is uh, a big part your of my thing. life. <laughs> <laughs> definitely your thing. Okay, so autophagy and stem cells. So in relation to neurodegenerative diseases in, in that case. Um, okay, but what, what is autophagy? Because a lot of people be listening to this and go, what the heck is that big word, autophagy? It's sort of... Uh, yeah, big word in, in biohacking circles, but perhaps not in the general public. Can you explain what autophagy is exactly? Uh, yeah, sure. So autophagy is a catabolic pathway that uh, degrades uh, dysfunctional organelles in the cell or protein prone aggregates. So um, any, uh, any material that is basically unwanted in the cell, autophagy can degrade. It's like the stomach of the cell. So, so it's like yeah. eating it. It's eating yeah, sort of. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. What, what happens when autophagy is activated, we actually have the formation of the so-called phagophore, which is um, a membrane structure that basically engulfs different, um, different organelles uh, and materials that need to be degraded uh, to form the, the so-called autophagosome, which is um, a, round, um, a round organelle that, that basically has the, uh, um, this cargo that needs to be digested uh, mm -hmm. that eventually fuses with the lysosome. And lysosome is another acidic organelle um, that contains acidic hydrolases that are able to digest this cargo. And this process is very essential for the cell. It's very vital. Um, it's evolutionary con conserved in, yep. in multiple species. Uh, from uh, from yeast to mammals, and if it doesn't work well, um, the the cell is basically in trouble because you have all this garbage, um, you know, um, uh, around. Flo floating around, and uh, there is nothing to to remove them. So uh, this is why autophagy is important, and we have different um, pathways that autophagy can be activated through as well. So one of those pathways is mTOR, um, mTOR, alien target of rapamycin, um, and then we have other um, pathways that can activate this um, uh, this process, such as AMPK, GSK3, and so on. 
and so is um, this is like is this like uh, sorry to interrupt but you know like because i know the people are out there and might be like well that's a lot of a lot of big words and a lot of information um how do, so is it like that the cell has to do a house cleaning and it, it's it's got mm-hmm. stuff inside the cell that is uh not working optimally and mm-hmm. needs to be gotten rid of or is it the whole cell so it's not apoptosis so it's not where the whole no, cell no. is is you know, disintegrating. No, it, yeah, it's actually, uh, it's a pre-apoptotic pathway. So before uh, apoptosis is activated, we have autophagy. And if right. autophagy fails in what it needs to do, then we have activation of some apoptotic pathways. So it's one step before that. And if everything goes well and autophagy is functional, um, and by the way, in different diseases, we might be having uh, different autophagy impairments uh, at different stages of autophagy. So it's either the uh, uh, the initial phagophore formation, for instance, that it's not working well and it's, it can't engulf the cargo or it's, um, it's later stages of autophagy, such as the, um, the, li- the acidic uh, hydrolases in the lysosome that are actually not that acidic. So their pH is not acidic enough to digest yep. the cargo. Uh, so we, we might be having different defects in the autophagy pathway in different diseases. And um, that w- leads to apoptosis. And right. yeah, if, if, if autophagy is not doing its work uh, correctly, then eventually we will have um, we will have apoptosis. And actually, this is what we're seeing in um, in, in in vitro models of neurodegenerative diseases as well. So, uh-huh. for instance, if autophagy is not working well, and we have let's say dysfunctional organelles such as mitochondria, dysfunctional mitochondria that are not working well, let's say they are uh, depolarized and they're not. Uh, and there is an excess production of reactive oxygen species going mm-hmm. on. So if, if nothing um, can uh, can degrade these dysfunctional mitochondria, you'll you'll keep on having this accumulation of reactive oxygen species, which eventually will um, lead to DNA damage and the activation of PARPs. And it's basically a death spiral that will keep on uh, leading the cell towards death. Okay. Well, so what is a PARP? You you mentioned PARP there, and just for the listeners too. So apoptosis is basically cell death, programmed cell death. So this is not, um, uh, what's the other one, necrotic uh, or something? Yeah, necrosis where the the cell dies for unnatural reasons, but this is sort of a natural programmed cell death. Um, Mm -hmm. But we only want that if if we're actually renewing the cells and we're wanting um, new stuff. So before that, the body tries to do this autophagy process. Is that that how it works? And then, so what is PARP? What is PARP? Um, Because that's a word, again. So PARPs are uh, a class of enzymes. And in order for them to function, they need a molecule called NAD. So nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And they're actually competing for NAD in the cell. And Ah. whenever we have increased DNA damage, uh, we would um, we would have the PARP activation as well. And this wow. would lead to NAD depletion, uh, which, um, which kind of brings me to my next point about what other enzymes consume NAD. And one of those enzymes are sirtuins, which are the so-called longevity genes that uh, are basically um, responsible for multiple processes in the cell, including uh, epigenetic regulation of, of gene expression. So they do, because um, sirtuins are a class of enzymes Enzymes that are also dependent on NAD and mm-hmm. they're also deacetylase enzymes, meaning that they remove acetyl groups from the DNA. Yeah. And as a result, they control which genes will be expressed in which tissues, which is very crucial for the cellular identity and for the proper um, uh, function of different cells. Okay. So um, sirtuins in, in a healthy cell, so sirtuins should be upregulated and they should be having this housekeeping gene where um, housekeeping function, where uh, they basically control what's going on with the um, DNA repair and also with with different uh, with, with the gene expression as well. And if we do have, if we do start having. Um, uh, impaired autophagy and let's say there is increased uh, reactive oxygen species because there are increased dysfunctional mitochondria in the cell you mm-hmm. will be having more activation of PARPs and all of the NAD will start being drained from the oh, PARP yeah. and the tunes will not have enough 
um, enough NAD to function. Okay. So there is actually I... quite an elegant interplay between autophagy, uh, NAD and sirtuins. Okay, yeah, okay. Can I just, you know, like re put that back to you so that so that we can slow down because we are going quite technical quite fast. And I think a lot of people <laughs> might be like, what the heck were they talking about? Um, so the Satuan genes basically longevity genes, and then one of their jobs is DNA repair, and another of their jobs is to say which genes are actually being activated right now. And these yeah. Satuan genes, and they're also responsible, I think, for cell replication. Is that correct? Um, um, they, they well, they helped. are responsible for multiple functions directly or indirectly. So for instance, um, the, the sirtuin 3 gene is also responsible for mitochondrial biogenesis and it's implicated wow. in, in, the, um, uh, in the amount of mitochondria that are being produced by the cell, which does um, which is related to, to, to cell replication eventually because you do need to have um, you know a, uh, enough uh, ATP levels to replicate. <laughs> Right. Yes. And so this is, and this is, so this is definitely to do with ATP production as well mm -hmm. and mitochondrial health. So these are doing all of these jobs, the Satuan genes. So they're very, very crucial genes in our, in our genome. Uh, and these are preserved across pretty, every species, I believe, every yeah. species yeah. On, on the planet. Well, so from yeast to, to, to humans, it's also Satuan genes are preserved very well. And when things are preserved across species, then that gives a scientist a, an indication that this is probably a very important biological function and we need to have a look at this one because it's, um, from what I understand. Okay, so when you have activated PARP because you're not doing autophagy well and there's things going wrong, it's taking the NAD. So NAD is basically like a fuel source that both mm -hmm. the Satuan genes and when PARP is activated, it's using... Uh, to to fuel its job and so there's this competition for competing fuel sources so like if you imagine you've only got one tank of fuel for your car but you've got to go in two different directions <laughs> and do two different jobs you're gonna how am I going to divide up my energy so then it becomes important as to how much NAD we have in the body so what is NAD again it's a nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide but what is that and yeah it, how does it, work? it does serve as a as a substrate for for all of these enzymes including sirtuins and parps and is basically a master regulator of metabolism so it's a very important molecule and uh, it serves as um, uh, without NAD the cell is not able to function properly just because um, this crucial molecule is implicated in so many different reactions so um, NAD is uh, is found in all, all living cells and organisms this is also evolutionary conserved across species Yep. And um, it, um, it exists in two forms, NADH and um, NAD+, which is the reduced and the oxidized form, respectively. Mm -hmm. And both of them are important, and both of them are implicated in multiple um, cellular reactions. So it's, Does it go uh, backwards and forwards in a cycle, NADH, NAD+, by donating electrons back and forth sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. Through, yeah, through the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So this is why uh, it's so important. And so what we're seeing now in, um, in, in the latest advancements in, in longevity research is that uh, we actually can supplement with, uh, with different precursors of NAD, such as nicotinamide mononucleotide, for instance, NMN. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the supplement that, um, that uh, um, my company is currently yeah. So you, yeah, you've you've now got that available on the market because this is such a crucial thing. And yeah, exactly. So and I think that it's um it's really interesting to also say that when it comes to the interaction between autophagy and sirtuins, uh, there is also another regulation of of autophagy there. So um, sirtuin one is actually uh, responsible for activating some transcription factors such as. TFAP and FOXO3 that have to do with, uh, with initiation of the autophagic process. So for this reason, when, uh, when we do have um, uh, dropping levels of NAD, decreasing levels of NAD, and there is not enough um, NAD for sirtuins to do their job, and let's say again, um, let's, um, let's talk about that previous example in neurodegeneration when you have increased reactive oxygen species and you yep. have um, increased Oxidative activity of parts, 
and oxidative stress and decreased activity of sirtuins, not only uh, the situation is already bad, but because uh, sirtuin one doesn't have enough NAD to function and to activate the TFAP and the FOXO3 transcription factors to initiate autophagy, um, now you have all of this, um, this functional mitochondria floating around and autophagy starts being impaired as well because oh, wow. it's not being activated enough. So it's a negative feedback loop, which, um, which actually accelerates the scenario where uh, the cell is going towards the uh -huh. uh, um, to, towards cell death basically so okay. so um, that means like if you don't have enough nad then your cert one gene is not going to be able to initiate autophagy and mm -hmm. clean up the cell and you're going to have uh, dysfunctional mitochondria um mm -hmm. does that is that independent of the mTOR pathway or is that uh, you might getting confused uh, so um okay so um Good question. So <laughs> what happens is, uh, so there are some molecules that activate sirtuin. So for instance, sirtuin one is activated by resveratrol. And this is, this is something that has been demonstrated um, uh, many years ago. And when, so um, when you have sirtuin one dependent activation of autophagy, um, you will, um, you will be having it through an mTOR independent pathway. Ah, and so it's a fasting mimetic resveratrol. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So uh, because uh, we now know that um, the mTOR activity is not affected by by intake of resveratrol, and this is this is quite crucial because actually, when, even if we want to um, activate autophagy, we shouldn't do it through the mTOR pathway. This is not the um, the, oh. the preferred way because mTOR is also responsible for growth and translation in the cell. So this is not it's um, it, it's also quite a key player in the cell. So um, it's a serine three union kinase and you actually don't want it to be activated um, at all times because this may lead Into. to cancer or other um, other conditions so what what we're uh, focusing on at the moment is to find molecules that are uh, that can activate autophagy in an mTOR independent manner okay and, so so yeah. if mTOR because mTOR is usually what's for growth it's anabolic it's it's <laughs> it, it, it's causing growth so so for example a bodybuilder goes to the gym they're in a in an anabolic state they are in an mTOR growth state and when you have autophagy that's sort of the opposite so it's a catabolic state where it's starting to eat itself so this is why so with mTOR most people like do fasting for that reason to to yeah, activate yeah. the autophagy yeah, yeah this is uh this is another good point there so when we're fasting and you know, there, there's actually um, um conflicting evidence out there as to when autophagy is fully activated yes yeah. so, uh, <laughs> thanks yeah, um usually people say that around 24 hours you you start having the autophagy activation um there are others that swear by the ketogenic diet and say mm. that if you know if you don't um, consume any carbs, you will get the autophagy activation anyway. Um, however, from 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 uh, what uh, what other researchers have found is that um, if you do um, if you are in a ketogenic diet and you do consume meat. Uh, it depends on what kind of meat you consume that oh. will either activate autophagy or not. And it all has to do with levels of different amino acids in the cell because um, autophagy is quite sensitive to, to nutrients and to nutrient starvation to be activated. So yep. if you have an abundance of amino acids, um, again, it will not be activated. So for instance, one amino acid that activates autophagy very well is leucine. And oh. if, uh, if you're eating certain meats that are rich in leucine, this is probably not good for your uh, for your autophagic state oh, so wow. this is something else to keep in mind and i've heard i think it was dave asprey saying that um if you're um if you can manage to be um on under 15 grams of protein per day uh you will probably keep the the autophagy going so okay um again but if you've gotten because a lot of people on keto think i can eat a lot of protein which is a bit yeah, of a, exactly. a, a, yeah. a mistake really it's it isn't about having um that's interesting because i had uh dr david minkoff on my podcast pushing the limits um a while ago and he has a product called perfect aminos which is a a, a really uh, a 99 percent usable form of of amino acids in, in combination and i was interested well hang on if i'm having that which is going a lot of good things in the body but is that going to inhibit my 
mTOR uh, autophagy, yeah. sorry, um, yeah, because exactly. I've got too much leucine in there, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this, is, this is a very good point for all of these processed foods as well. So, for instance, there are some some ready meals you can get, or some some protein bars that that claim to have all yeah, of the no carbs and everything, and then the uh, <laughs> and then they slam um, uh, a badge on on their pack saying that it's vegan as well. But then, uh, why is it vegan if it has all the amino acids? Because that's the that's one of the selling points when you're actually on a vegan diet or you have some some days where you are on a vegan diet, you want to get yourself in a state of, of some of partial amino acid depletion to get this beneficial effect of, uh, of enhanced autophagy and, you know, on, on um, intercellular toxins and so on. All right. So for certain periods of time, you want to do this and it's a cycling thing. You don't want to be completely deficient yeah. of aminos for too long because then your body will start to break down. Um, this is this is what I do personally as well. So during the week, I'm um, usually so I, I am a fan of, of, of keto slash carnivore diet. So mm -hmm. this this diet is quite comfortable for me. And I enjoy it quite a lot. But then um, during my week, I, um, I, I try to have some days where I'm either vegetarian or vegan, uh, yep. just because I want to have those benefits. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, up and down. And, and and this seems to be a theme in biology all the time is that, you know, it's not one thing. It's not staying on keto forever and ever. Amen. It's about doing cyclic keto or cyclic yeah. vegan It was cyclic, you know, and the body loves this push and pull and this recovery and this growth and then cleanup yeah. phase, growth cleanup. So that's so, um, so, so, so autophagy can be activated through fasting it can also be activated through having resveratrol and upregulating the CERT1 gene. Um, mm -hmm. How else can we activate autophagy? Mm -hmm. So there are different ways. Uh, there are different things you can you can really implement in order to activate autophagy. And I think that um, it all has to do with how you build your lifestyle in general. So I think that in order for your body to function properly, you really need to uh, to, to have a kind of a healthy routine in general. And, yeah. you know, um, an analogy that I can give you there is that, uh, you know, there are people that would buy a couple of supplements and then they would be so proud of it and then they would say oh yeah but i'm taking those supplements now and i'm so healthy and then their <laughs> biorhythms are all off and you know they, they sleep at 5 a.m every day and they're they're eating crappy foods or super processed foods yeah, and then it's not gonna work <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's all good. So I, I think that when it comes to being healthy and activating your autophagy levels and um, having a healthy lifestyle in general, um, you need to start with the basics first. Yes. So um, the intermittent fasting is definitely the first step um, to take in order to, to become a bit healthier. And, um, you know, from, from the research that I'm reading and from, from the things that I'm implementing, I, I, I definitely believe that both anecdotal and scientific evidence point towards the fact that intermittent fasting is actually the way to go. Yep. And I mean, you know, there, there are conflicting opinions out there and there are pros and cons in every diet and so on. And I, I get that, but I personally believe that uh, with intermittent fasting, if you try to narrow down the window where you're, um, you're uptaking uh, food, this is very, very good for you. Yep. So this is, this is step number one. Yep. And then again, um, so either you're trying to raise your NAD levels or you're trying to activate your autophagy uh, because the, those pathways are, are quite intertwined. And um, what you eventually want to do is you want to have um, increased levels of sirtuin, as sirtuin 1 in particular, um, and sirtuin 3, of course, and so on. And for this reason, um, in order to preserve this, um, the, the, this pool of NAD that is available for the sirtuin 1, to activate itself and activate the autophagy pathway. Um, another small tip that I can give is to actually avoid sunlight, which is something that people oh. um, don't don't really consider. But uh, what happens when, when we're exposed to sunlight, when our skin is exposed to sunlight for prolonged periods of time, we start getting the DNA damage. And when you get the DNA damage, you have the PARP activation. And then again, the your NAD oh, pool. Wow, I never connected those dots. That's really interesting. So because yeah, it, it, I mean, we, we, we need sun. Mm -hmm. We need sun for vitamin D and for our mood and, yeah. and, and all of that sort of stuff. So you're not saying don't have any sun. Yeah, yeah sure but with 
because the sun is causing DNA damage, it's going to cause more PARP activation. It's going to have the sirtuin genes going to repair the DNA. That's going to use up the body's resources is what you're saying. Yep. Yeah, okay yeah, wow exactly. never yeah that makes sense <laughs> makes sense you know like you what you, yeah and, and and by the same token you know like things like smoking that breaks dna like no tomorrow um mm -hmm. yeah and you, this is why smoking ages you is because of all the dna breaks and this is why when you're in the sun for hours every day you yeah. you you get wrinkly skin and you get you know uh collagen loss and all the all the rest mm -hmm. of the you know things that are happening so anything that's going to be causing dna breaks is going to cause you to age quicker exactly it's using yeah. up the resources basically yeah. wow yeah. okay so it's it's obviously you don't have to become a vampire and it's okay <laughs> to walk in the sun you know when when you want to go somewhere but a sun bathing for hours is definitely not something you want to do with uh, to, 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 to get your body go through basically. Um, so that's, that's another tip. And then something else, uh, really, really simple, uh, that can be implemented on a daily basis in order to maintain your sirtuin levels. And as a result, your, uh, uh, your, your autophagy levels and your NAD levels is also to, to take a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, which, uh, contains oleic acid. And it basically, um, does the same job as resveratrol virtual and it's, wow. it's quite interesting i think that the, the there's been a recent um a research article out that shows that lake acid might even be more efficient than resveratrol in terms of activating sirtuin one which i think it's really really cool and wow. um, so you, yeah well combine the two i do <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely you can do yeah. that and then, um, you know, you need to make sure that the uh, the extra virgin olive oil is actually of a very good quality. Exactly. Because there's a bunch of, you know, there's diluted. a bunch of rubbish out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure it's, you know, from an orchard that you know, it's cold pressed, it's all those extra virgin, it's all that sort of good stuff and not, um, uh, how do they do it with solvents uh, and, and stuff or uh, that it's come from multiple or orchards and been cut with other oils. It's a really, really important yeah. point. And then oleic yeah. acid does so much good things in the body. Yeah, um, yeah. Exactly. But isn't that bad, Alina? Like lots of people are like in their in their minds, they're going, but oil is fat. It's the same with MCT oil. You know, there's this, you know, isn't isn't that going to make you fat when you eat fat? <laughs> there's still uh, a lot of that around. <laughs> <laughs> there are good fats and there are bad fats. Exactly. So olive oil is a good fat. MCT oil is a good fat. Avocado is a good fat. So not, not all fats are made equal. Uh, so this is definitely something important to keep in mind. And, you know, with, especially with, uh, with a good quality extra virgin olive oil, um, yeah. there is. Because each, each one of our, uh, each one of our cells is, is, is a membrane that is a phospholipid, isn't it? So I mean, yeah, we need yeah, fats absolutely. to actually this building of our cells and to the yeah, integrity. We have, we have a phospholipid lipid, uh, phospholipid layer in the brain as well. Wow. Uh, and this is why we actually supplement with omega-3 fatty acids because this is what it does. So this is what omega-3 fatty acid do. They they go into the phospholipid membrane, um, uh, lipid membrane, and then they um, they they basically um, make the integrity of, yeah, of that membrane yeah, they, they better. Contribute to the healthy phospholipid uh, layer in the brain. So that's why it's very important for neurodegeneration to have omega threes going in. And again, people get quality omega threes, not your cheap supermarket ones that are perhaps oxidized and been sitting on the shelves for six months. Mm -hmm. um, so really important to get a reputable source there. And omega threes, of course, in fish as as, as well, and um, uh, krill and and so on. Okay, so but is there a downside to fats? Because you know, I study epigenetics, and a lot of people's profiles come back with don't have too many fats. And um, I've been it's been one of those things in my head is like, well, why would some people not come back with you know, you shouldn't have too much fats? Um, I mean, there are things like gallbladders being removed, that's yeah. a pretty specific thing, but um, uh. It, it, most is, is there a genetic component? I'm probably not your wheelhouse, really, but is is there a genetic component to your ability to process fats? Uh, like there the is FTO a good genes genetic and component, and I've actually seen this uh, with you know a family that has um, uh, that has a history of of um, of a very problematic uh, digestion of uh, of 
you know, fats and so on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but yeah, again, not all fats are made the same. And, you know, when, when you, you cut off the bad fats from, from your life, uh, you know, things change and everything changes really. Yeah, and, 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 and it really is very satiating too to have a little bit of fat and it can really help with cravings and blood sugar spikes and but getting off topic. Um, <laughs> so so you you have a company in in NMN Bio um, which produces nicotinamide mononucleotide supplement um, and you've got a whole range of other stuff coming as well. Why did you decide like you you need to get this out there on the market, you know, based on your research and your knowledge around this area? Why is it important that people take NMN if they're serious about slowing yeah. aging? So so first of all, I um I came across the biology of NAD and NMN during my PhD studies and my research kind of led me um into this field because I was studying autophagy neurodegeneration and actually um I still cannot disclose my uh, my research yeah. data. Uh, yeah, it's not published. My paper from my PhD is not published yet, but hopefully soon. Uh so we're um we're we're about to submit it quite soon actually. Um so for this reason I started started studying the biology of NAD and I actually saw how important and how crucial NAD is to the cell and what happens when we have um, a lack of NAD and depletion of NAD pools uh, in the cell. And um, I've been supplementing with, with, with different kinds of vitamins and supplements my whole life, really. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, oh, I, I, I was watching closely this space for a while and I was taking different supplements myself for a while. And I, uh, so wh when I came across NMN and I realized that actually there is um, this strategy where we can supplement um, with a precursor in order to increase our NAD levels. I found it really, really interesting. And I thought to, um, you know, give it a go myself and try it out and see the results. And then what struck me was that the immediate effect of the supplement. So within a few days, you can already feel a difference in your energy levels and your focus. And this, you know, this, this comes from the fact that uh, sirtuins are responsible for so many molecular processes in the cell. And, and this is why you have this effect, including the mitochondrial biogenesis, which is, um, which, which gives you basically increased ATP um, yep. consequently, and then so you, you, get, have, you get actually more mitochondria. So, like, if you've yeah, got yeah, you know heart yeah, disease, the production you, of more mitochondria, and then they produce more ATP as a result, and then you you, you have this energy. energy. Yeah, so this is why I thought to uh, to bring this product into the market. And the other reason was that there was not enough reliable suppliers on the market, which is crazy because it's actually quite a popular supplement. Um, it's been um, mm. it's been on the rise the the interest was rising for the past couple of years but uh what we're seeing is there is a lot of um you know a lot of uh white, white labeling uh, yeah. companies that you know don't don't offer any certificates of analysis and, and so on and also you have um even big companies not offering proper certificates of analysis which was uh, like it, it, it was so amazing <laughs> to me like yeah i don't understand you have a big company and you know you have just the purity report from like 18 months ago and you don't have any other analysis such as heavy metals or ph or um you know microorganisms so the consumer is actually not confident um in 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 buying from you and you know i wanted the the best quality for myself and my family and yep. then i said wait a minute so you know this this is not done right and this is why I, I i launched the company because i wanted a company that was completely transparent and you know i even say it on the website um that you know if you if you're interested uh in in finding out who our suppliers are and so on and you know uh, have any questions about our supply chain just, just feel free to reach out to me and I would be happy to disclose all of those things yeah. because um, you know there there are other companies that uh, you can't find any registration number or who the founder is and so on and it's quite confusing really because like you you don't know who you deal with this is the same with the whole supplement industry and this is the you know yeah. it, on the one hand it's good that it's not regulated by the FDA and whoever else there are authorities around the world because like then you know 
it'd turn into the pharmaceutical industry, which don't get me started. Um, but <laughs> but on the other hand, there's no, there's not enough regulation around the quality yeah. control. And one of the things when I was searching for enemy and searching the world for it, I I I, I had to go overseas and import it to, to friends in America and get it out of there. And and this is why <laughs> I like was super excited to discover your work. And then uh, you know we've since um, now made it available down here. So we've got a branch down here. In New, in New Zealand for New Zealand Australia um, yeah. and and I wanted someone who I could trust, who has all the, the, the scientific knowledge behind it. There's, it's all lab tested, et cetera. Um, and that was really important for me for quality. Um, just on a just on a side note, so I've been taking NMN now for, I think, so five, close to six months. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I've had a massive weight loss and so has my mum. Why would that be? I, you know, like I didn't, take it for weight loss I wasn't overweight per se or uh, but I had a couple of kilos that I was quite glad to get rid of and mm-hmm. um, I've, I've what I've noticed because I'm you know I'm an athlete that's my background um, I haven't lost a, an ounce of muscle um, muscle which has been really awesome because most people are struggling to keep muscle mass lose fat mass um, mm-hmm. My mum has lost 11 kilos and she is of a genetic body type that really struggles with weight loss. She's a conservation metabolism um, from a genetic point of view, very, very hard for her to lose weight. So I've never seen this in the history of her entire life um, <laughs> since I've been around um, that she's, it's, the weight's just dropped off her. Is there some sort of upregulation in, in in the metabolic pathways? Is is it improving the insulin resistance? What's it doing there to cause such weight loss without muscle loss? Well, in my study so far, uh, there is definitely evidence that it does improve insulin sensitivity, and it also improves the lipid metabolism profile. So those two are very important. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have those studies in humans yet. But you know, more clinical studies are on the way. And hopefully, we'll have very good results this year um, with with the NMN besides the safety studies that we already have in humans. So in mice, what we're seeing is that there is there is basically a, a, a reverse of type 2 diabetes wow. which is you know really impressive and you know if you if you want to correlate this data into humans somehow um, you know I, I would say that uh, obviously I'm not a medical doctor and this is not a medical advice uh, but I would say that it does have to do something with uh, with the metabolism and it basically improves the way your body metabolizes everything and um it's you know they're trying and and there's no downside to any men is there there's no it's a it's a vitamin b derivative although people yeah. have said to me well can't i just take b3 and be done i was like no it doesn't work like that <laughs> I wish it'd be a heck of a lot cheaper. <laughs> that's, the, that's the other impressive thing about this compound is that um, it actually doesn't have uh, any, if any, side effects at all. So even in in studies with mice, where um, the the dosage that they use in mice is actually much higher than it is in um, uh, the one that uh, we're we're usually having in humans. So for instance, if someone would take 500 mg or one gram of NMN per day in humans, then in mice studies, they use something like 200 mg per, per kilogram of weight, which is much, much more. And it still doesn't have any side effects. Well, so, is that then, do we need higher dosages of it then, like in the human, like, or I is mean, it only been tested to one gram? And why has it not been tested higher, if that's the case? Uh, no, I think that there are studies on uh, underway uh, for this as well. Uh, so eventually, we will find what is the ideal dosage for humans. I think that from from you know anecdotal evidence, people can already see results from 500 mg or one gram and so on. There are people that take more. So you know, some biohackers say that they take two grams or four grams uh, and it's still very well tolerated. Um, but uh, yeah, so far uh, it's uh, it's definitely it, it does not produce any side effects in terms of um, in terms of any downside. Ba- basically, and um, for instance, for myself, my stomach is quite sensitive. So when I'm on an empty stomach, I can't take vitamin C or caffeine, and I get yeah. nauseous and so on. And this is not the case with NMN. So I can take it first thing in the morning, and it's very well tolerated mm. on an empty stomach, very mild. Uh, I, I really love it. There's so have many mine. ways to love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have my morning and night. 
Uh, so I'm on a gram a day. Um, mm-hmm. And I have, is there any reason not to take it at night? So I split the dose, um, reasoning, um, thinking, I know, would, keeping the levels I would, up. Yeah, I mean, I would probably take it all in the morning. I think that th- there's been a study out that it can affect the circadian rhythms as well. And mm-hmm. interestingly, it actually affects um, NMN, um, sorry, NAD levels affect the circadian rhythm. Uh, but it's not the other way around. So NAD actually dictates the circadian rhythm uh, in the body. So uh, for this reason, I would suggest to take it in the morning because then your whole body is synchronized and you basically, you wake up and you tell to your body that, look, it's the morning now and we're going to have increased NAD levels. Oh, okay. So, (laughs) okay. I got that. I got that wrong. I haven't, I haven't noticed that I've had worse sleep or anything like that, or that my circadian rhythm has been out, but I would definitely swap to doing my, my thinking process process around that was keeping the tissue saturated uh mm-hmm. you know over a 24 hour period as opposed to yeah, yeah. you know all at once and then it perhaps dropping but i don't know what is the half-life of it do you know um is there any sort of evidence around that uh, i actually uh not don't, sure there's nothing no, no, there's no evidence know. yet is and so yeah the, there's a ton of studies still being done that are currently like this year like going to be yeah. coming out which is going to be really exciting um, mm. So that we're going to get more evidence. I mean, I, there, there's this stuff that I've been reading around fertility uh, in in animal studies, and they're starting to do human studies, which I personally am very interested in, um, mm. and reversing aging of the ovaries, and even um, with oh, with nice. yeah, I mean, the, the mice study was incredible around fertility, where the mice were postmenopausal, they actually knocked yeah. off any existing eggs. Uh, with chemotherapy, then gave them in and in, and the, the the mice went on to have babies. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I believe that, there was a horse study. Story. This is why is. I got so excited about NMN, and this is why it's my first product because, um, frankly speaking, as a scientist, I've never seen results like that with a wow. natural compound. No, you know, there, because there is a bunch of uh, natural compounds out there. There is a, a bunch of other supplements. And, you know, we were talking about spermidine the other day. Yeah, yeah, and, another you know, very interesting. Uh, another autophagy activator. Uh, quite an interesting supplement, yes. Uh, it, uh, by the way, it's also an mTOR independent autophagy activator, which is good. Another very yeah. good reason to take that as yeah. well. And we, we're looking into that, aren't we, uh, Alina, yeah, uh, about absolutely. adding that? Yeah, yeah. To the we will look into this, but uh, but again, it's not like you can't like you don't see your results like the ones that you see with NMN in multiple studies um, from from other compounds. It's really fascinating. Wow. So yeah, and so there are other products that are going to, and this is a super exciting thing. Like where you know where our grandparents or our parents even didn't get the chance, like you know with. Um, aging was aging and there was nothing that you really could do to influence how fast yeah. you aged that were well, they they weren't aware of it and later mm-hmm. on it's become oh well if you eat better and you exercise a little bit more and you stop smoking and and stuff mm-hmm. you'll you'll age slower but now we're taking exponential leaps in our knowledge mm-hmm. I mean I don't I, I fell into this realm when I was uh, reading Dr. David Sinclair's book, who's a very prominent scientist at Harvard Medical School and read his book, Lifespan, which I totally recommend people reading. I was just like, oh my gosh, if, if I can stay healthy now, because <laughs> I'm 52, <laughs> if I can stay like really, you know, in top shape for another 10 years, by then we're going to have stuff that will help me live really long. Exactly. And that really, that really excites me. And not just live long, but live healthier you know, so that yeah, because that's the important part. The important part is not to just increase your age, it's to increase your health span. Absolutely. So the um, time that you're spending being healthy and uh, what you're referring to is actually called um, the, the aging escape velocity, where we're basically will have more advanced research coming in every year of our lives. And this will eventually expand our lifespan, which is amazing. And I also think that, you know, if we preserve ourselves well, uh, yes. we might as well see this in our, li- in our lifetimes, uh, which will be amazing. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I want to, I want another few decades, please. You know, <clears throat> listening to Dave Asprey, who we, you know, both I want love. another like few hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Hey, I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous right now to the, to, to, <laughs> but if you listen to like Dave Asprey saying conservatively, and this is in Dr. David Sinclair too, like conservatively, yeah. we could live to 150, 180 and beyond. Yeah. And once they crack the code and they're actually able to turn the cells back, to yeah. their, which they are working on right now and which they can actually do in the Petri dish from what I understand, like with skin yeah. cells and make them immortal. Um, yeah. And they can't, they can't yet do it in humans because it's too risky. They could turn you into a tumor and stuff. But with the Yamanaka factors that were discovered a decade or so ago, they're actually able to turn the clock back to the point of you being a 20 year old again. And, and this is like, wow, this is, this is pretty exciting. Um, being able to regrow nerves, spinal injuries, people who've gone blind from yeah. macular degeneration, um, all of these things um, are coming there, down the line, you know, and this uh, is really, there are really exciting. Many, there are several advancements in this field. So as I said, my PhD is also in, in stem cell biology. So I was working with human embryonic stem cells in, in the lab. Wow. And what they can do on, on the dish is just mind blowing because uh, what, what I was able to do was to take human embryonic stem themselves and then dictate their fate basically with different growth factors and then differentiate them into neural precursors at first and then to push them further uh, in order to become terminally differentiated neurons. And wow. then, you know, like four weeks later, you basically have a human brain on a dish and it's a primary human cells. And it's, uh, it's an amazing um, physiologically relevant human platform as well to study disease. And this is what I was doing during my PhD. So um, I, I seen it with my own eyes and, you know, every time I would do, I would go through this process I would differentiate the human embryonic stem cells into neurons, it, it would be as exciting as the first time because of, you know, what it represents, because it does represent the, the progress that we've made so far. And I, um, I personally studied human embryonic stem cells for the sake of drug discovery. Um, yeah. So I wasn't interested, my, my project was not focusing on different therapeutic applications. However, I know that, you know, there, there are many advancements in this field as well. So we do have uh, clinics in America where you can have, you know, a total, um, you know, to total body rejuvenation. Yeah, stem cell replacement. Stem cells, um, <clears throat> and so on. And, you know, the, this technology is definitely advancing. And I've been actually thinking about the application of this for myself. So as you know, I, I recently had a dental injury. Yeah. And um, you know, this is something to, uh, to, to keep in mind for the future. So perhaps in the, um, in the near future, I can just, you know, inject myself with a bit of a stem cells there and, uh, and, and close. And, the, uh, yeah. And that's already happening uh, to a degree. <laughs> I mean, I've got a, a doctor friend, um, up North who's doing stem cell replacement you know, for joints and so on for degenerative joints. And, yeah. um, and, and because stem cells basically for, for people, um, who don't understand why this is important the stem cell is the original like cell before it decides am i going to become a skin cell or a neuron or a liver cell and differentiates it's a, so it's a pluripotent stem cell it can become anything and so yeah. in the lab setting you're going to be able to say well i want you cell to become a liver cell will we eventually be able then to grow organs that can be used for transplantation is that sort of one of yeah. the end goals absolutely and you know it's already been done with some organs so for instance i've heard that there is uh there is a research group that basically 3d printed uh, a functional thyroid gland from stem cells which is you oh, know wow <laughs> 3d printed yeah so you, so the printer gets these differentiated cells somehow and and then makes it into a functioning organ that they will eventually they're going to be able to actually transplant this into into people and and and, and save the whole organ donation horrific troubles that we have 
currently. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, we're not too far away from this, from, from whole organs being, um, you know, recreated in the lab. We already are able to actually do uh, 3D culture in the lab and create the so-called organoids. So for instance, from stem cells, you can do a brain organoid where you have um, you, a little sphere and it basically consists of, you know, of different kind of cells that you see in the brain. So it would have neurons, it would have glia, it would have astrocytes, and then you would have this brain organoid and then you can study it. So, you know, we're already getting there. It, we're, we're close, you know, we're, we're much wow. closer than we thought we would 20 years ago. And, you know, I think that, you know, we're not far away from, from having um, different kinds of organs being grown in the lab for, for transplants and so on. Hopefully not our brains because we want to <laughs> the seat of who we are and where our you know it gets a bit, a bit like honestly reading dr sinclair's book i was like like am i in a star trek movie or something you know because it is pretty pretty amazing but when you do this you also start to understand the whole process and how the whole thing functions and then you can actually you know already slow down neurodegeneration and um and and optimize things and and so the the enemy that we're talking about right now is the beginning of this really exciting road um, mm -hmm. at which, you know, we're going to be staying abreast of and, and uh, you know, hopefully adding to uh, what, what, what we have available to the, to the consumer right now for prices that are not moon money, you know, that it's out of anybody's reach, but actually what you can do today so that you can preserve your health so mm -hmm. that in 10 years' time, um, when the real crazy stuff starts coming online, you'll be able to live longer and healthier lives. <laughs> that's that's the whole goal of it. Um, so can you just, like, before we ra just wrap up, I just wanted to reiterate again. So how is autophagy, can you just put that, how is autophagy related to NAD and the sirtuin genes? Can you just put that mm -hmm. two pieces together again and just repeat that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. So basically what happens is that um, you do uh, need autophagy to recycle different damaged organelles in the cell. Uh, when something goes wrong, so um, and this is this is quite prominent in neurodegeneration because um, the reason we have let's say aggregate prone proteins in neurons and and dysfunctional mitochondria and so on is because uh, neurons are terminally differentiated cells. This means that they don't divide anymore, so they rely on autophagy um, in order to um, um, uh, for, for their ha housekeeping. Uh, function because they can't divide uh, the, the junk away. Okay. okay. So th that's the reason why autophagy is important in terminally differentiated cells, such as neurons. So and neurons don't differ. So they don't. So there's no hay flick limit for a neuron. There is just only one when a neuron becomes a neuron, that's a neuron. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's it. Um, and what happens with um, with the uh, up, the uh, the activation of uh, of autophagy? One of the signals is um, comes through sirtuin one, which basically can um, can uh, activate the transcription factors that are related to autophagy activation, which is the TFAP fa um, transcription factor EB and FOXO. Um, which are um, basically um, uh, influence the activation of autophagy and more specifically the mitophagy as well. So mitophagy is the arm of autophagy that is res responsible for the mitochondrial clearance in the cell. <laughs> yep. So, mitochon so mitochondria, just for people, are, are the powerhouses of the cell. This is where um, a lot of the energy, so all of the energy is produced, if you like, um, and so this is why mitophagy, as opposed to autophagy, so mitophagy is doing the same process, but within the mitochondria to keep your mitochondria healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, you're if your mitochondria are not healthy and they're dying and you're not having enough mitochondria in your cells, then you are going to be sick. And that will, could be heart disease, that could be neurodegeneration, that could be anything. So keeping your yep. mitochondria healthy is the basis of all bloody disease, <laughs> to put it blat blatantly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So then um, if you have um, impaired, um, Im impaired autophagy in the cell, and then you also have some sort of a, a DNA damage going on, uh, such as the one from reactive oxygen species, for example, mm -hmm. then what you'll have is the activation you know, of the PARP enzymes. And uh, PARP enzymes heavily rely on NAD levels in the cell in order to function. 
And NAD is also a, a substrate for the sirtuin genes that are responsible for also uh, regulating a bunch of, of very healthy, um, a, a bunch of processes in the healthy cell. And for this reason, if you do have increased activation of PARPs, you, you will eventually get this NAD drain out of the cell, and this will not be enough in order for the sirtuins to, um, to, uh, to, to function properly, and this will also deplete your autophagy. So both um, NAD levels and um, autophagy are important to the cell, and fortunately for us, we can actually replenish the uh, um, the levels of NAD by supplementing with NAD precursors such yep. as NMD. Okay. And so in intermittent has been proven to be bio, most of our bioavailable because there's also like nicotinamide riboside, which is used in a number of yeah. supplement companies that I know have nicotinamide riboside, but not many, there are some now, but um, mm -hmm. have nicotinamide mononucleotide and nicotinamide riboside is also a great molecule, but it's two steps away uh, yeah, from exactly. becoming NAD. Yeah, so nicotinamide riboside needs to uh, be phosphorylated and to uh, and thus converted to nicotinamide mononucleotide first, and then this will enter the cell, and then this will um, this will increase the levels of NAD in the cell. And for this reason, uh, so first, you know, the um, the um, area um, um, this area of research was focusing on the NR molecule, the nicotinamide riboside, but then when um, you know when they started studying in NMN, they actually um, saw that there is increased bioavailability and there is uh, increased levels of NAD that come after supplementation with NMN. Can you take, because NAD is a molecule, you cannot just uh, take it as a capsule and then it's all good to go. Can you take it as an infusion? Because I have heard of NAD infusions. Is that, I, I mean, it's I've not available here. But... Well, and I'm, I'm curious myself about this. Yeah. And I, uh, I haven't done it, I haven't tested it. And from what I've seen, um, so the, the concentration of NAD in those intravenous uh, injections is quite low. And I think that, you know, uh, the same way uh, that we have many opportunistic companies in the supplement uh, field, we also have many opportunistic clinics that offer this kind of treatments. So um, um, again, this is not something that I have um, studied in depth and I actually don't know how how you know how well it it will um, be how available it will be yeah how, how, how much will it help um but yeah i mean this is another way to boost an id i guess and yeah. you know we can try it out uh but you know with oral administration of animan we do have evidence that um you know it can boost the levels of nad in the tissue and uh, in liver tissue and muscle tissue and so on um and also it's much easier to do and it's obviously much cheaper because those injections cost a lot yes yeah um just one last question in relation to antioxidants because i mean you know 10 years ago or so we used to think oh reactive oxygen species oxidative stress happens when you know through the electron transport chain when we're metabolizing and so on we get all these oxidative stresses and free radicals running around and if we take antioxidants we're going to be counterbalancing that does supplementing with antioxidants like vitamin e like glutathione like vitamin c uh, and, and so on alpha lipoic acid is that going to contribute to to the slowing of aging because it's going to downregulate the 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 PARP enzymes, um, or yeah? yeah. So, so people were very optimistic about antioxidants, um, you know, something like twenty years ago. Yeah. And you know everyone was talking about it and so on, but actually the the, the big studies that have been done have shown that uh, you know by taking antioxidants uh, you actually do not suppress aging, and you know there are some biomarkers that might have changed in those studies, but most of the biomarkers that they measure stay the same, um, basically uh, saying that you know antioxidants is not the uh, um, the, the, the holy grail the aging <laughs> that everyone was uh, was thinking of. hoping, <laughs> yeah. Not to say that antioxidants don't have their place because they definitely do, especially if you have a lot of sure. oxidative stress and you need sure. to, you know, yeah. like with vitamin C, if you're infected or, you know, I've done a whole series on vitamin C, um, mm -hmm. but that it's not the holy grail for um, stopping the aging process, but it probably does help um, with, you know, not having so much PARP activation. 
Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, as a non-scientific brain, I'm just <laughs> connecting dots. Um, okay, so I think that's probably we've we've um, so so a lot from a lifestyle intervention. Apart from taking NMN and resveratrol and oleic acid or olive oil um, and, and intermittent fasting. Is there anything else that we can add to our, our anti-aging regime on a lifestyle um, intervention um, side? In, intermittent fasting and then, uh, you know, avoid exposure to sunlight, as we said. Um, and, and, you know, sirtuins are being activated from any kind of stress. And what we can do is we can also um, induce some sort of, a, of an artificial stress, which could be done, uh, let's say, with cryotherapy. This is what cryotherapy does. You know, when yep. you're exposed to cold, um, mm -hmm. you, know, you also have this, um, the, the, the stress signal that activates sirtuins or the other way around. So you can, you can try out a sauna. Um, and this will also have the same effect. So um, I think this is this is also something to keep in mind. Yeah. Then breathing, in breathing. So you know, sort of yeah. um, tumor breathing, or you know, like what Wim, Wim Hof does, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so these these hermetic stresses, these exercise, obviously, um, that, that cause yeah. a cascade of changes and make you stronger. And it, yeah, it, it, it's sort of a, a balancing act. You don't want to be doing exercise for Africa or really freezing yourself to death, but you just yeah, want to yeah, have yeah. a little stress to yeah. cause a change in the body. So these, these hermetic stresses can be very, very helpful. Okay, well, I think we've um, covered a very, very, very complex topic and, and I hope we didn't lose everybody on the way. But <laughs> at the end of the day, take NMN, take resveratrol, take olive oil, do your exercise, get in the sauna. If you have a chance for cold therapy, do that as well. Get your exercise, get your antioxidants in there as well. Uh, to a certain degree um, and and you're going to be able to live long enough until um, other things come online and you'll be able to improve everything <laughs> sounds good <laughs> brilliant so Dr Alina um, thank you very much Dr Alina has been on the show NMN bio so we have nmnbio.co.uk uh, in, in the UK and in Europe and nmnbio.nz uh, if you're down this end of the world, uh, we'd love to help you over there. If you've got any other questions, please reach out to us. And thanks very much for uh, being here today. It's been really exciting. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me.